welcomed all of you, some current students, some past students, uh, some faculty and friends, thank you all uh, for coming today. Uh, uh, I just had this long and very interesting interview with Emily Larkin uh, of The Vantage. I have no clue how she might misquote me. <laughs> so take it with a grain of salt when you read it. Uh, but one of her questions was, how did uh, this show come together? And that, that's often a question people kind of start with, how did this show come together? And so when I announced my retirement from the Stepline Gallery after 12 years, uh, I wanted to have one year to teach, just teach and not do the gallery, because there are two very different jobs. And um, so I thought uh, maybe I would take the last show. You know, it was kind of my farewell to Newman. I had, I've been in exhibits here, I've been in exhibits all kinds of places, but I thought this might be a chance for me to kind of make a farewell to Newman. And so uh, they granted me this last exhibit. And when I took the exhibit, typically you would submit a proposal of what you're going to do. And of course, they were kind enough to not ask me to submit a proposal. <laughs> I was like, run with it, girl, run with it. And so uh, I just knew I wanted to fill the space in some way and tell a story, but I didn't know exactly what that would be. And then uh, Laura Thompson, who will speak to you in just a minute, Laura Thompson, uh, who's a dear friend, showed me some of the sketches of her mother that her mother had done as a fashion illustrator. And I just got goosebumps. I just knew I wanted to include those in the show, uh, that that just extended the story uh, of my lifetime, of the, my generation, and of uh, art, and of the dresses, and so on. So I was very excited to invite Laura to include her mother's work in the show. And then I had um, Maria Soames, who is uh, not an art major, but has finished an art minor and gone probably beyond the art minor. And I had her in an advanced drawing uh, class last semester. So, you know, I still hadn't really put this whole show thing together. And uh, she was doing these beautiful uh, feminist pieces, kind of uh, kicking the can at uh, stereotypes about women and things that women just are sick and tired of hearing and being pegged as, and I asked her if she would include those drawings in the show, and she graciously said yes, and I feel like the, the three of us have put together a nice cohesive show uh, that covers, you know, two, three generations, maybe, Laura's mom and Laura and mine, and Maria's generation. And then the other thing people keep asking is why, uh, why say goodnight, Gracie? And I think there's some old geezers in here who know what that means. And so for those of you young people, there was this great vaudeville team, George Burns and Gracie Allen, uh, comedians, the best of the best. And in the 50s, 60s, maybe, they had a TV show. So they went from stage working into a TV show, and they were very funny. And George Burns would often narrate it. And then at the end, they would come out of the set, and they would chat with the audience a little bit. And, and Gracie Allen was probably like one of the original dumb blondes. You know, that's always funny to people. And so uh, he would say, say goodnight, Gracie. And she would say, goodnight, Gracie. So, uh, for me, this is just good night to Newman. So this is my good night to Newman, my kind of closure, my farewell to Newman. So say good night, Gracie, uh, became the title of the show. Um, I hope you enjoy it beyond this lecture today. You will read the little cards I've said to many people. I typically don't explain my paintings. You know, as the uh, cantankerous artist, it's like you get it or you don't get it. You know, get it or don't get it. Uh, but because you guys are so precious to me, all my little students, I wanted you to get it. Okay? So I took my jaded, rebel, mean spirit out, and I wrote, a, <laughs> wrote some little stories for you uh, because I wanted you to get it. And I wanted you to kind of understand it. And I'll explain that a little bit more. But I'd like to turn it over to Laura Thompson and uh, let her tell the story of her mother, Ellen Clark. So, Laura, thank you very much. I'd like to uh, thank Mary and Shannon for the opportunity to share my mom's work. 
This is her first and most likely her last show. Um, the kind of work she did was, was not the kind of thing that she would uh, put in, in a gallery at that time. It, it has later become art. Um, so I just want to say good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura Thompson. I'm going to use notes because I might get a little emotional. I'm going to be sure I get everything shared with you that, that I want to. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, Mom's illustrations. Um, her name is Ellen Clark, and she'll turn 85 in just a few weeks. She was born in 1934 in St. Louis, and she worked primarily in the late 50s, the early 60s. She took a break to raise kids and then worked again in the early 70s. Um, so her images are on the side wall. As I stand in this room, I love the, the contrast between the black and white and the colorful. It's just such a wonderful balance. Um, this, this room is just great to stand in. So, um, so when I, the way I set it up um, is it starts in the back here and then you work your way around. So this Mary, I was became one of her students. I had to learn how to put a show together. So <laughs> I went through all these images and started with storyboards because that's really where ads start, that whole ad process. So it starts with storyboards, then there's a group of three here that has an image paired with an ad. And um, my dad probably cut those out because he's very anal about getting things just right. And those are not just right. Mom just kind of ripped the page and threw it. So I knew that was her work. Then the next group really focuses on texture and detail. Then we get into uh, dress silhouettes. And then this was most, these were done up until about the end of 1961. And then these three are in the 70s. So that's kind of the, the time frame there. So in the, uh, the year that she worked, these images would have been just tossed. It was just part of daily work, part of her job. There, there was nothing. Once the image was produced in the, the paper, it, it, there's no need for it to exist. But for some reason, she brought home some of these images. Um, I was so little, you know, being a kid, I didn't pay attention to what, what she was doing. It's just her mom stuff, and it's just around. But I didn't really know what it was. Um, so when we were cleaning out her house a few years ago, we, we came up with, she was downsizing. She, she, to, she's in assisted living. So she had a big stack of uh, sketch pads and, and all these images, and I didn't quite know what to do with it. But I knew I didn't want to throw it away. She's, she's ready to just toss it. I thought they were, they were not something that we should lose. Um, so, um, so I'll talk about the ad creation process. So it starts with those storyboards in the back. Um, those are on really thick cardboard. They are meant to just generate ideas. So if, if you get a chance to look at them closely, you'll see there a lot of work went into that. There's a lot of detail. It's a lot more than just let's get the general concept. She put work into it. And these were used to um, teach the rest of the department store. What are the terms? Um, there's the, uh, the tall story is the hat. So we'll be using the tall story in the next few months. Uh, the rambler, that's a shape of a curse. So let's get used to the word the rambler. So, so that was a way to educate people. And it became the basis for, for the ads. So then the, the real process, the, the daily grind kind of thing, was done with using most of these images. Um, so ads were really tools for showing consumers what the new styles are and what's on sale, what's available. So I think we do the same thing today. It's just a different media. Just this is a very similar process. Um, so after the storyboards and before the images are done, what I don't have an example of are sketches. She would just sit and do sketches and sketches and sketches. Because she had to also work with where will the verbiage go? Where will I tell people that this is a dress that's on sale or this is what you should be wearing in the spring? So she would pose her, her figures to make room for that, that verbiage. So that there was a little bit of influence there. Um, she, uh, so her tools that she used were pen and ink, craft tent paper, and developer. So you're probably very familiar with India ink. Um, it gives a really strong black line, and also um, it can be controlled extremely well. So this, this group of four here, if you look closely, there's some very tiny wording that I swear it was done with a, a human hair. 
but it is, it's just so clear and just, just very delicate where you get a really nice, thick, thick, strong line. And she was just a master at controlling that line. So with her control of that line, she had quite a vocabulary of marks that she used, and that really uh, led to her very expressive faces and, uh, uh, and, and just her wonderful gestures that she gave, gave her figures. Our friends in the back were cleaning out their mother-in-law's house and, and ran across uh, big stacks of old newspapers. I had a chance to go through those thinking maybe one of her ads would be in there. There weren't, but what I did find was ads done by other artists of the same period. And what they did not have is the expressions that, that my mom's works had. So, so there's a, more of an element of, of art going on there. Oh, so then the other tool she used besides the ink is craft tint paper. So craft tint paper is very special. It's very translucent. Uh, it's almost like tracing paper. And then there's a pattern impregnated into it. But you don't really see it as you're drawing on it. And if you need to, you use developer. And that developer then will bring out the darker colors. So the cross hatches serve two purposes. It was an easy way for artists to just get texture in. You could just take a brush, put it in the developer, and just run it across the paper. All of a sudden, these perfect hash, mark, hash lines come up. And but then also, the newspapers needed it in order to develop the, uh, the dots that were in the, in the ads that were actually printed. Because really, newspapers only print black ink. So to get the gray, you have to have varying sizes of black dots to, to create a gray field. Oh, so then um, there's even instructions. So this last piece, I, mean, I found that these three, three images were just uh, practice pieces, and she just cut them apart. But if, if I reconstructed them, you could see the, uh, the instructions on how to use a developer, and how to be sure and let it dry. You've got all your instructions right there. So, um, so I talked about craft tint paper being very thin. It's like tracing paper. So she would, when she's got her idea pretty well formulated, what it would look like, she would lay that craft tint paper over her sketch and get out her pen and ink, and then just start making the image just freehand, just, just drawing it. Um, and if she had to make any corrections, there, you could do it with paint. She would just plop a little bit of white paint on there, and it was fine. Then the last step of this process was to take a type sheet with the verbiage that would be in the ad, take the image, and walk down to the newspaper and say, here's the ad. So there's no phoning it in, it's, it's not really walking it in. Um, I don't really have an idea of how often she did this, probably about once a week, maybe twice a week, she would uh, take the liberty ads. And what's interesting is, if you look at these images, there's a lot more detail in the hand-drawn images than what actually shows up in the paper. Um, so these, this, this paper was also used for magazines that is a, a slicker, um, better quality. And so you could, um, magazines would actually reproduce from the craft tint just as well. But that was the tool that you used, and if it didn't uh, translate, that's fine. It, it works just, just as well. Uh, follows the, the ad process. So. Oh, so mom's strength was really in rendering uh, facial expressions, giving her figures these long, elongated, flowing lines. Um, and she really liked to study other artists. Um, she was especially uh, inspired by Van Gogh's potato readers. And there's a whole series that he did of these really exaggerated uh, faces that have very rounded cheeks and a very specific jawline. And you can really see it in her images that she started producing in the 70s. It was this little round, round uh, chin and, and, uh, uh, and cheeks. Uh, she was also influenced by uh, Lavigliani. She he had uh, prints of his all over the house, and she just she loved those beautiful long necks and just everything about Lavigliani. It's extremely elegant. Um, but she would take those influences and, and put it into her illustration. Um, and what she had to do was work with proportion. So fashion models uh, really can't exist in the real world. They are just gangling long things that, that don't exist. So think about photoshopping that we use in, in these days and, and how we modify our photos. She was doing the same thing with drawings and, and making unreal figures. So when I was a kid, she sat me down and, and taught me how to draw. She said, the first thing you do is you make an egg shape, put 
put it where you want the head to be, and then figure out what kind of body you want. And it'll be seven and a half heads for a regular person. If you want a more elegant person, use eight heads. Or if you want a fashion model, go with nine, 10, 11, whatever. <laughs> and so I got to look at these and then you know, and see, you know, what did she choose? So this uh, uh, figure, the two figures here, this is not too exaggerated, kind of a normal looking person. But you get down here, this is uh, about 10, 10 and a half. It's a tiny little bit, so I just I mean, love those long, flowing pants. So she really played the proportion to, to, to give that, uh, that flowing uh, look to, to her, her figures. Uh, so there's reoccurring themes in Mom's life. Uh, it really revolves, revolves around fashion and clothing. Uh, she uh, also worked in alterations. She, she loved to sew. She just loved everything about clothing. Her uh, grandmother was a dressmaker and a hatter in St. Louis, and then her mother was a corseteer. She was the woman at the department store that, that helped you find just the perfect corset. So um, there was a lot of just clothing from, the, from history in, in her house. Um, my mom has no formal education in art. Everything she learned, she learned in high school. And then she took <coughs> one pattern making class as a night class at Washington University. Um, so her talent just comes from, she's just got talent and she practiced and, and looked. She was always looking for influences, um, just uh, seeing what's out in the world. Um, she grew up uh, in, with a lot of free time. Her parents divorced before she was one year old and her mother worked, so she had a lot of free time to draw and she just drew the things that were in her home. And that would be the dresses and the hats that her grandmother had made. Um, the, the extra corsets that were just there so the grandma could do practice or know what the, the, how to fit the corsets. Um, so she, um, after high school, when she graduated, she went to work at the Federal Reserve. She processed checks. Um, that gave her you know, a lot of time after work just to continue to draw. Um, her brother came to WSU and worked on his MFA in painting, and he encouraged her to come to Wichita. Uh, she decided, yep, yeah, she would do that, and she had no idea what she would do, so she um, she brought her portfolio and got a job at a department store. So um, she just sort of fell into this, but she got to do what she loved and do it all the time. Um, it was in a time when women were really not encouraged to work when the kids came. So as soon as I was born, she, she quit working. She took that break to raise, raise her kids. Um, and in the late 70s, she decided to go back to work. And that's where these, these images came from. She started practicing, so those three little images together there are just her trying out new things. We can really see the difference between the style of the 50s, she was very much influenced with styles of the 70s and um, how the looks had changed. She just went to uh, the local uh, women's clothing stores and said, I can make stuff for you if you need it. And the village clothes line picked up on that. And they had her do several ads for over the course of about two years. Um, and uh, so really, printing changed. There was no need for handwritten or drawings. The whole world changed, and that's when it stopped. So she, she really did not uh, do anything professionally after 71. But she uh, continued to be involved with uh, alterations in, in clothing. Um, she's always been painting her whole life until just recently, within about the last year, she stopped painting. Her image would become very abstract because she always paints from what's in the mind. The picture's there, just, it just comes out. She really couldn't understand why I couldn't draw or paint very well because we just, it just comes out, but not for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I'd like to thank you for letting me share Mom's story and her images. And thank you again, Mary. This is, this is just a, a wonderful honor for me. Are there any thank questions? Thank you. No, oh, I, I, for those of you, yeah, for those of you, yeah, for those of you, um, oh, yeah, for those of you who, uh, <laughs> Uh, we're at the show the other night, you got to meet Laura's mother. And I think she felt uh, excited. I'm not sure if she understood exactly why, but she recognized her work, and I think she was very excited uh, to be here. She so, was. So she really was. Wanted to make sure she felt honored. She did. And so, uh, Maria, and Maria, feel free to go back and point at your piece. This little man with the camera, he'll figure it out. <laughs> so, Maria Soames, a Newman student. <coughs> that explore the roles and stereotypes and experiences.
experiences of women in society. And so they were inspired by these vintage ads that I saw while scrolling through Pinterest. And they're, like most of them were from the 50s, and they're very sexist if you were to see them. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to take the ads and kind of present them in a way that subverts the idea or the concept that's being presented so like in a satirical, ironic way. And so um, one of the ways I did that was by presenting this faceless woman. So what I did, well, if you think about ads, um, especially when they comment on the female experience, they're plastered with this smiling, pretty, sensual face of this woman who's found her fulfillment in whatever product or idea that's being sold to them. And so I took away their faces and replaced them with the actual like stereotype or concept that society is trying to sell on the female experience. And so, and I like the idea because it also kind of presents this inward rebellion. So like their bodies and their rules, like they portray this grace and obedience, but like the heads kind of break that structure. And that's why I made the borders, like their heads break the borders and so. Um, the first one was, um, it, it comments on the idea of how women are told to smile all the time by men everywhere, strange men, and they haven't even you know, seen. And the idea that women are prettier when they smile and there, there's this like this idea that it's actually this act of submission, if you think about it. So like they'll be like, smile, or why aren't you smiling? And so anyway, um, the second one was inspired by a personal story um, about my grandmother. Um, so in high school, her professor wrote two equations on the board, and he asked her and a male student to go up and solve them. And so my grandmother solved it like that. And he like looked at her and he's like, no, that's a fluke. He's like, you can't do that. And so he wrote another one on the board and she solved it like that again. And he's just like, no, women aren't allowed to, or women aren't supposed to be able to do that. And so it's like this idea that women with intelligence or clever women, it's like this idea that it's unnatural. <coughs> And so I kind of, that was the story behind that one. The third one with the gumballs was inspired by a Sylvia Plath quote, which um, says that women are not just machines that you put kindness coins into and sex falls out. And I think that a lot of women everywhere experience this um, idea that they need to repay a man with sex for his kindness. So if he pays for your meal, or if he's kind to you, or if he compliments you, like, you have to give him sex. But, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the fourth one is what comments on the idea that our society has this concept that a woman's body is dangerous, and that she has to cover her body or that she doesn't own her body or, you know, like this victim blaming mentality that unfortunately is still in our society. Um, and the last one was a fun Christmas one I did. Um, and it's titled Blue Balls and I think it kind of speaks for itself. <laughs> <laughs> so that is my work. So thank you very much. to cover in this uh, exhibit, of course, is uh, the illustration as an art form and uh, painting with a story and uh, kind of taking the twist or playing against the stereotypes that I think women live with all the time. And so I think it, it is kind of a full story. It goes full circle. And there are lots of things that kind of move back and forth between the images, whether it's the purses in Ellen's and the purses that show up in the painting, or uh, the Christmas uh, story of Maria and the Christmas painting, you know, that happens over here. That there are lots of ways that these things connect and work back and forth and make a really cohesive kind of uh, exhibit. And so many of you are very familiar with my work, and this is kind of a retrospective. Uh, a lot of newer work actually has sold, and so what, what 
I have is this stash of stuff that I feel like is my kids. You know, these paintings are like my children, you know, and sometimes they live in plastic bags to keep the spiders and the dust off of them, but they're kind of my kids. And uh, so people often ask me a couple of questions. And one of them is, why the dress? You know, why do you paint dresses? Why don't you paint people? And, um, and my mother was a portrait painter and uh, was never interested in painting portraits. And what I wanted to do was to tell a story without the person, you know, to make it more universal than a specific person. If you paint a specific person, then the story is just about that person. And people look at the face and they look at the eyes and they don't see what else is going on in the painting. And so what I did was take the person out and keep the trappings, kind of the trappings that go with it. And so as I, this little pink piece, uh, which was uh, an homage to Gustav Klimt's uh, portrait of Sonia Nix. And so when I was, uh, and Craig printed it off of me, first thing I did was put my thumb over her face and say, yep, that's what I do. <laughs> you know, that's what I do. I do. And uh, I looked, uh, even most recently, at a website uh, that has like 534 portraits of women. And all of these portraits, you know, you have the, the little face, the beautiful, compliant, smiling, happy face of some elegant, rich woman, because they're not painting poor women anywhere. These elegant, rich women, and, uh, and then it's then in the dress. It's all about the dress. And so when I was in college, and as some of you college kids know, you get sick and tired of painting still life. So, oh my God, we have to paint one more wine ball and, you know, a loaf of bread and an apple. I think I'll shoot myself, you know. So, so I started doing things like painting my portrait in a toaster, you know, you know, kind of stuff. You know, whatever you could do. And I grabbed anything that wasn't an apple or a bottle of wine or, or something. And it ended up being shoes and purses and stuff like that. And what happened was, um, women, fellow students and other women, would bring me a dress. It would bring me a dress. Oh, I know you're going to want to paint this dress. I wore this to the prom. I said, well, why don't I want to paint your prom dress? <laughs> I got a prom dress. You know, why? But, but what happened out of that was that there's this narrative, and it's pretty universal, and that is that women keep their clothes. They keep their dresses. And you guys might be thinking, yeah, they do, but why? <laughs> well, it's because it's how you see yourself in the world. You see yourself as the mother of the bride, uh, the prom date. Uh, you see yourself in the black suit at your mother's funeral. You see yourself in a particular way. And maybe you were a, a smaller weight. <laughs> you know, maybe you were smaller. You're never going to fit into that dress again, but you cannot get rid of it. Because it is, it is a part of who you were when you presented yourself to the world in some way, at a Christmas party. And we had this experience. Shannon was telling me about her Easter experience, where she had this lovely dress on, and she was going to go meet some of her new fiancé's relatives. And he said, oh, just put some blue jeans on. Or just come on over. They don't care. And it's like I wanted, she wanted to present herself in this way that she saw herself in the world. You know, that most, that moment where you're most something, most elegant, most funny, most pretty, most something. And so people were bringing me clothes. And sometimes I painted on real clothes. I gessoed the clothes and I shaped them kind of like that paper dress and I painted on them and I painted on slips and underwear. I did a piece for the wall that was called, uh, they're keeping the same secret and it was a hundred brassiers. It was a hundred brassiers that were all spray painted gold like Cadillacs. You know, they were just the big, big bras and little bras and droopy bras and whatever it is, that training bra is. You can't really train them. <laughs> They're not like dancing bears. Uh, but I did this whole, whole wall of brassiers. And the funniest part was that in my grad studio that semester, they were replacing air conditioning ducts. And I had 100 golden brassiers, right? And when I went to hang it on the wall, there were only 99. And all I could think of was some air conditioner guy had a gold bra on his toolbox. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was pretty funny. And I, did a, I did a piece with pantyhose. 
And I got, I had a box outside my room and people would bring me all kinds of stuff. Hopefully they washed it, but, uh, and, and pantyhose. And I had did 13 pairs of pantyhose on pink hangers, right? Pink, that color we hate. Pink hangers. And then I took those like strawberry scented red wax lips and I put them at the crotch. And so they were all smiling. Made a lot of men really uncomfortable. <laughs> Pantyhose of different colors and different sizes, which represents who we are, different colors and different sizes. And uh, I called it the acapella choir. <laughs> and so did that. I did some other funny stuff. I did a whole series of what we call dead dresses, where you know, in the olden days, they draw a chalk line around a dead body on the floor. You know, this was long. And so I, I did a whole series of dead dresses where you actually put tape around the dress shape and the purses and stuff, and they were laying on the floor. <laughs> so lots of fun things. Uh, people often ask me if I have a favorite piece, and I have lots of favorite pieces, and some of them aren't here. Uh, but some of them are. And so I've told all the little stories. You can't have this piece. It belongs to Craig and Laura. I mean, there aren't any, you know, stories up there. But lots of different pieces. I think the one of the things I think about art generally is it's all autobiographical. It has the movement of the of the artist, whether it's a brush stroke or a mark. Uh, it comes out of the artist's mind. It comes from their brain. And so it doesn't matter what you're painting or what you're drawing or what you're sculpting. Some part of that is autobiographical. It's telling your own story. Um, a few, some years ago, um, Gail Davis, who was the uh, director of the Women's Studies program at Wichita State University when I was there, and I did a minor in uh, Women's Studies, minus a one credit hour in assertiveness training. Uh -huh. And I just couldn't get that one credit hour of assertiveness training into my college schedule. And so I didn't get the whole thing. And my kids said, oh my god, asserting this training, I should have given you credit for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a class you don't need, Mom. <laughs> you shouldn't talk. But, but, uh, but Gail Davis wrote an article about this dress diary. And the story is up there. The story of the dress diary is up there. And I have to say, my paintings have n nothing to do with the dress diary. The dress diary was in a box, in a shoebox somewhere for years, and I didn't even know I had it. And I'd been painting dresses for a really long time. But when I found it, and Gail Davis made this connection between the dress diary and my paintings, it was kind of gave me goosebumps a little bit. So the actual dress diary is really very small, okay? It's a little tiny diary from the 1930s with all the fabric swatches in it and all the little dress designs that my grandma made. And so in the 30s, you often had to make your own patterns, or they printed patterns in the newspaper. You know, you could cut the patterns out of the newspaper. And so one of the things she did was she told the story, grandma told the story as if she were the child, because obviously, you know, my mother wasn't old enough to write this old story. So she wrote the story, when I was two, mother made me this dress, that kind of stuff. And so I have this original dress diary. It's become really kind of important to me over the years as I kind of continue to uh, paint dresses and work with dresses. But the dresses are really the universal statement about maybe a particular people or a group of people, a particular person. And so uh, they have lots of different qualities. And some of you that were here the other night may have noticed that uh, many of you know Sister Tarsicia. Do some of you know Sister T? Okay. Well, uh, some years ago, when I was uh, had some paintings in the uh, gallery in Santa Fe, and uh, these are those paintings. One of them actually is old. Uh, uh, the one called uh, "My Train of Thought Made Too Many Stops." It's kind of like I changed my mind, but I forgot to change my shoes. Uh, and so the great delight in that was that Sister T had gone to Santa Fe and she had her picture taken. Uh, in front of my paintings, and then she sent it to me. And I think that was gave me one of those uh, goosebump moments that Sister T was there, you know, and sent me a picture. Uh, that was one of those very kind of meaningful moments. Okay, so we're about out of time. I know you guys have a one o'clock class, and some of you have my one o'clock class. Uh, so, do we have any questions or comments? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Go for it. You've been in the art business a long time. Speculate 20 years for what do you think the art business would be like? Oh, you know, I, I can't even begin to speculate what 20 years could do because things happen faster and faster and faster and faster. What I hope is that people are still making stuff and that it's not all done on a computer. You know, we have 3D printers and we're excited about 3D printers and we can paint on a computer, we can do all that stuff. Uh, but even I've had students come back to take classes so they can learn how to hand render things. You know, if you can't draw, you can't draw on a computer. The computer doesn't do it for you. You have to have some hand skills. And so over the years I've had students who maybe were even interior designers and they come back to school because they had to really learn how to draw again. So I hope think people are still making stuff. That's what I hope. Yes. I wanted to clarify with Laura about how her mom was employed because it sounded like from what she said that her mom actually worked for the stores. She did not the newspaper. Correct. She worked for the department stores. Yes. So she was sort of a freelance. No, I guess then the department store had an art department. Oh. And, the, and each department store had its own little art department. It might be two or three people. It might be a big store, five or seven. Wow. And each of those people was making the runs to the newspaper every every week or huh. a couple of times a week. I always thought they were done at the newspaper. No, huh? Okay. So that's like, yeah, that's she, interesting. Yeah, she, she worked at Ennis's and Hinkle's. Huh. Different department stores. Okay. 